Being all holy does not only mean withdrawing from something. It means withdrawing unto something. We are not separate merely to make others look unholy. In your self-righteousness. Rather, we withdraw into man's original state of communion with God as we live holy lives. Amen. It's back to how it should be, as it was in the beginning. That is why in almost every place Paul refers to holiness. He does not refer only to culture, but takes it's all back to creation, Amen. as it was, the original state. So therefore, these are matters of practical holiness. <coughs> Amen. Three times in only 16 verses, Paul refers to the order of creation. Salvation is a process. Amen. When we receive justification at the time of our initial salvation, we are saved from the penalty of sin. Amen. Amen. If we then allow God to lead us into a state of holy living, he performs in us an ongoing work of sanctification. Amen. Amen. That saves us daily from the power of sin. It's important. Praise God. But if you allow that process to continue, we finally receive glorification at the time when Jesus comes to take us to be ever in his presence. And then we'll be forever free from the presence of sin. But it's vital to remember that we can short circuit this lifelong process and forfeit our salvation. Yes, we can. And tell if we do not allow God to lead us into sanctification. <coughs> That's why many go back to the deadly elements. They leave God because they short circuit. They don't live a life of holiness anymore. Now, most issues of holiness are not salvation issues. They are Christian maturity issues. In other words, sanctification. Sanctify yourselves. And you need to sanctify yourself every day of your life. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why some of these teachers are infrequently taught because God expects a mature Christian to continue mm -hmm. without repeating it to them. That's right. Amen. Let's put the book into context today. Now the church in Corinth was founded by the Apostle Paul as a result of 18 months of work in there. You find that in Acts 18 and verses 1 and 11. Now, after he left Corinth, a lot of grave disorders broke out. And he made at least three visits to Corinth to try to straighten out the problems. You can read out of that. I'll ask you to write it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14, and chapter 13, verse 1. He wrote at least four letters to the Corinthian church. But we only have record of two of them. Now we got it in our Bible as the first and second book of Corinthians. But really they are the second and the fourth book. We don't have the first and the third. We have the second and fourth. First Corinthians, the second letter, was written in response to several questions from the members of the church to Paul. You can read of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. The lowest accusation of those days was to call someone a Corinthian. <clears throat> Do you know why? It meant to be sexually immoral. That's the character that they had at that time. If they call you a Corinthian, they say that you're not living good. You're sexually immoral. Amen. Mm -hmm. But the Corinthian Christians had allowed the sins of the city inside their church. Mm -hmm. Believers 
not sinners, were hindering the work of God. Please take notice. The main problem of the Corinthian church was that its self-centered members constantly try to exercise personal freedom without regard for the needs of others or the glory of God. It is just self-centeredness trying to exercise personal freedom that's still going on to this day within the church of the living God. Now let's put the chapter in context. In 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with these problems. Envy, strife, and division in the church. In chapters 1 to 3. Then judgmental attitudes, especially towards those in leadership, complaining to the leaders and that they were rebuking them. And what was it? Rebuke for the toleration of sin. Chapter 5. Reproof for going to court against the brethren. This is what Paul is telling them. And warning against moral impurity in chapter 6. Only after dealing with these issues did Paul turn to the question asked by the Corinthians. And this is where we come into it. As Jesus said, some matters were weightier than others. It would be of no benefit for the church to be externally holy, as holy on the outside, in a Peter's action, if they were not internally holy. Amen. Praise God. Amen. In the attitude of their heart. Who was 1 Corinthians written to? Well, who in, is chapter 11 written to? Does it merely deal with the cultural problem at Corinth, or does it contain principles? Amen. Of holiness that apply cross culture in every culture. In every place, it applies to all churches in all cultures. We are not void of it. It refers to the church today. Okay. Some will say, I just obey God's direct commands. Symbols don't matter to God. Don't they? We better be real. Tell that to Israel, the symbols don't matter. Mm -hmm. They kept feast days, they made sacrifices, they built the tabernacle. Tell it to Moses. What did Moses do? He forfeited his entrance into the promised land because he smote the rock twice instead of once. Mm -hmm. Symbolism is important. <clears throat> Praise God. Mm -hmm. Tell it to Joash who forfeited. Yeah. Victory over the Syrians because he didn't smite the ground enough times with the arrows. That's right. He only struck it three times. He should have struck it more. <laughs> then he would have a complete victory. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Tell it to Jesus who instituted the Lord's Supper. Tell it to Peter who redirected the first century evangelism to the Gentiles because of one <coughs> symbolic vision. The sheep let down three times. One vision. Tell it to John who received almost... All his grand vision in the la of the last days in symbolic language. Symbols do matter to God. Amen. Praise him. He had a role in the law of jealousy. Mm -hmm. Numbers chapter 5 deals with it. When a woman's hair was loosed, uncovered the woman's head, she lost a symbol of Morality. Mm -hmm. Cutting the hair is not right for a Christian woman. Scholars believe the sentence for those guilty of adultery was to have their heads shaved. If a man was suspicious that his wife was having an affair with somebody else, he would take the, his wife to the high priest, and the high priest would uncover her head. That means the priest would shave her absolutely bald. Yes, right. Because that was a sign of adultery in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm. Mm. Then she would be a curse amongst the people. Mm -hmm. But if she was innocent, then <coughs> her husband would know her and she would become pregnant. Yes. And in becoming pregnant, it would be a sign, oh, she's not guilty. Mm -hmm. God is all wise. Amen. 
a Jewish man marrying a prisoner of war. Deuteronomy 21. Would shave her head. Why? Since this was a matter of a shameful woman, it completely repudiated her old pagan lifestyle as a Gentile. Scholars agree that once she became an Israelite, her hair would be allowed to grow again. Are you getting it? <clears throat> Let's go to the Nazarite now. Number six again. Had three specific restrictions. They could not eat things made with grapes. They could not touch a corpse. They could not cut their hair for a specific time. There were three rare occasions. Amen. Exceptions. Samson, Samuel, and probably John the Baptist. And Nazareth would always cut their hair after a specified time. Usually about 30 days. Amen. According to the Mishnah. Although double and triple those for 60 or even 100 days, it went on sometimes. Now, the Nazareth vow resembled the sanctified life of the priest, except it was done spontaneously and to God by ordinary Israelites. So what do you see with the rust of hairdos today? That's totally out of order. That don't mean nothing inside of God. Those days are gone. And furthermore, after a certain period of time, they've had to cut their hair. Because the Bible tells me that for a man to have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Uh -huh. Do you know why? Because his, hair is cut, his head is covered. Uh -huh. As a man, we have a hair cut short because he is our head. And Amen. we have to show our head. Amen. Amen. But the woman, her hair is given her for a covering. Yes. Not a hat. Uh -uh. 1 Corinthians 11 does not talk about hats. Uh -uh. Talk about the hair. Now, we need to get things right in the sight of God. Amen. That the Nazareth vow not only set a man apart, but also shamed him. Mm. Perhaps signifying the shame that Jesus would endure. The shame of the cross. Imagine the great mighty God condescended to come down in the form of man to be spat upon, to be beaten, to be tortured in such a, a, a horrible way, mm. and then the, the shame of the cross, mm. ramming those nails into the palms of his hands and into his feet. Mm. All those atrocities. Man, Lord. My. He took on your shame and my shame. Amen. My. Now, some contend that because women also put Nazareth vows, that's in number six, chapter six, verse two, they cut their hair as men did at the end of the vow. However, they overlook the fact that the woman's vow was always subject to her father's or her husband's approval. Mm. She didn't know the of her own accord. God himself specifies the limitation in Numbers 30, verses one, to 16. Please take note of it and study it for yourself. Mm. Since the entire point of this limitation was submission, and the Bible explicitly teaches that a woman's hair is a symbol of submission, mm -hmm. you don't need a hat, you don't need a veil. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're missing the mark if we think thinking that. Now, many scholars and historians believe that while women let the heavy and kept for the specified time, they did not cut it at all. Others contended while Paul taught men to have short hair, he himself took an answer like that, basing this opinion on Acts 18, verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila having shown his head in Caecrea, for he had a vow. Mm. However, the vow referred to in this verse is from the word called Yuchi, mm. the same word used in James 5 for the prayer of faith. Paul did not shave his head because he was finishing the Nazarite vow, for the New Testament church did not practice that. Mm. 
Amen. He had just been delivered from the court of Gallio. So he needed to cut his hair because he was going to pray. Mm. He couldn't pray <coughs> without his hair being cut properly. Mm. Having been mm. in prison that time, didn't have his hair cut as he should. So that's why that's mentioned. Amen. Sometimes we miss because we do not study as Christians should. Amen. You should study into the history of the church of the Old yes. and the New Testament. Yeah, You'd be surprised what you can find out. Now, Paul knew that God cared what his hair looked like. Hello? Are you getting it? Note that Jesus was not a Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. Amen. Of Nazareth. He drank the fruit of the vine. He touched dead bodies, raised them from the dead. He had short hair. All men of Christ there, they wore their hair short. It was poor. Mm -hmm. Never any longer. Mm -hmm. It wasn't shoulder length. That's what people have put. You have never seen a photograph of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's man's imagination. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, the Talmud states that the hairstyle was Julian, like Caesar. And the priest cut the hair once every 30 days. Mm -hmm. Do you know your hair grows eight inches in the summertime? Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, do you know that? Praise God. Mm -hmm. We need to know these things better. Yes. Now, in Ezekiel 44 verse 20, we read this. Neither shall they shave their heads nor suffer their locks to grow long, they shall only pull their heads. That's God's instruction mm -hmm. to his people. <clears throat> Until recently, images of his lights were not found depicted in ancient artifacts and earth by archaeologists. This is because of the injunction against making of graven images. Mm. They would not have that done. Now, God's judgment on backslidden Israel were symbolized by the shaving of the head or the cutting of the hair. Amen. Isaiah 33, 24. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. baldness. Jeremiah 7, 29. Cut off thine hair. Mm -hmm. And his blessings when they repented were symbolized by growing hair. Ezekiel 16, 7. Thine hair is grown. Israel, God's wife, is always symbolically presented as a woman. Mm -hmm. Where are you going, Pastor? Shame or judgment on a man was symbolized by the extremes of baldness or shaving the head. Ezra, chapter 9, verses 3, and 2 Kings 2, 23, by his long hair. Daniel, in 4.33, he had the Nazarite vow. There is not one verse in the entire Bible that looks favorably on a woman cutting her hair. Recognize the historical significance of hair. And this is what we're going to. <coughs> Due to the consistent association of hair with rebellion, listen, it would certainly be valid and biblical for godly leadership to make a case from history for a church standard concerning hair. However, because we have a direct standard concerning hair, there is no need for them to do so. It's there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It was still good practice to investigate the associations involved with hair in human history. In doing so, we find that there was no issue at all for the first 5,900 years. <coughs> Amen. Of recorded history. The widespread uh, act of women cutting the hair began in the United States during the Roaring Twenties. Mm. A decade defined by a spirit of frivolity, materialism, immorality and rebellion. The world had survived the First World War, but not without paying the price of a great 
societal upheaval. During the 1920s, no national issue arose in America other than that of women bobbing their hair. Hmm. <coughs> now, let's go further. It is a mark of identification. To shave one's head is to remove one's self-image. So one can begin a new self-image. Put each verse in context, and this is what we come to. Here and in several places, this is verse 1 of second, First Corinthians chapter 11. Here and in several places in the New Testament, Paul teaches that, uh, that to be an example to others to follow. It is the perfect transition verse between chapter 10, which teaches us not to damage our witness amongst fellow Christians by our actions. Eating meat sacrificed to idols. And then chapter 11, which teaches us not to damage our witness in our culture by our actions. Mm. Women not wearing a veil. Mm. Hmm. No such question. Okay. The examples given in both cases are specific to Corinth. Mm. But the principles taught are undeniable cross-cultural for all time. <coughs> it wasn't just for Corinth, it's for now. Mm. Verse 2, Paul was appreciative of the kindness of Corinthians to him. But that would not have sufficed that they had not kept his teachings. The word ordinances here is paradosis, or traditions. In several places, the New Testament, Paul teaches things which are not direct commandments from God, but which he expects to be followed, because they have grown out of his experience as an apostle or elder in the church. Remember, the Apostle Paul was taught personally by Jesus. 1 Corinthians 7, 6, But I speak this permission, by permission, and not of commandment. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Mm -hmm. Then 1 Corinthians 7, 12, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. We never go wrong by submitting to the teaching of God the elders. Come on, brethren. Amen. Then, when dealing with matters of minor importance, here, the wearing of veils, in his epistles, will usually first enunciate the grand eternal principle on which his conviction rests. And this is it. Before giving an admonition to the Corinthian women about their appearance, he shows them how they should be under authority. Mm. Kepale, the head. A submissive heart on the inside will always demonstrate on the outside. Mm. Is this idea of being under authority culturally determined? Like <coughs> with one another with a holy kiss? Or is it an absolute principle for all time? The answer is found in the last phrase, and the head of Christ, that's his humanity, is God, divinity. Mm -hmm. The nature of God is in no way culturally conditioned. It is the absolute reality for all time. Our submission is based on that truth. What truth? The background. The problem in the Corinthian church was not with Christian women cutting their hair. Every reputable scholar emphatically states that moral women in all cultures of Paul's day did not cut their hair. The problem is that Christian women, enamored with their newfound freedom in Christ, were no longer wearing veils as their culture demanded. This unintentionally identified them with the heathen priestesses, the local temples, amen, mm -hmm. to Apollo and Aphrodite, who offered their worship bareheaded and disheveled hair. And thus, by associating with the hundreds of temple prostitutes, who even cut off their hair, to offer its sensuous religious rites. That is why Paul tells him in the same epistle, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Mm. Now, <clears throat> a man is not allowed to worship something with something down over his head. For example, a veil. This would not be relevant to Paul's discussion of veils to women. 
except that he wants to show them the more important principle of etching. A man does not wear a covering which can be seen because his head is Christ, mm -hmm. is also invisible. Mm -hmm. So that's why man keeps his head short, mm -hmm. because man is the glory of God. Amen. Man, God is the head of man, and the man is the head of the woman. Mm. On the other hand, the woman is not to worship uncovered, mm. without a veil. Mm. Don't look at the physical side of it for a moment. It, not necessarily because it invalidates her prayer, but because it dishonors her head. Who is her head? Husband. Her husband? Oh, she's not married. Her father. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that's in that culture. In that culture. The woman is to wear a covering which can be seen because her head, which is the man, is also visible. Mm -hmm. If she refuses to wear a veil, Paul says that she might as well be just, just shave her head, identify her with the Corinthian slave women mm -hmm. and adulteresses. Yeah, that's what he was identifying them with there. Because she's already bringing shame to her husband mm -hmm. by doing that. It's even all this one and the same thing. And so he emphasizes that if a woman is not going to wear a veil, she might as well shame, shame herself by cutting her hair. Mm. He says, if it be a shame for a woman to be shown, that's cut hair, identifying with temporal prostitutes, mm. that's who are cutting the hair. Mm -hmm. Okay? Let her be uncovered. Let her be covered. Mm. Scholars agree that these women would never even think of cutting the hair. Paul has made his point. Mm -hmm. Rebellion in the minor area is still rebellion. Mm -hmm. So when the women were cutting the hair, it was total rebellion. Mm -hmm. But your hair. what they the overlooked, the whole thrust of chapter 14, which is to teach order in the church. Mm -hmm. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under <coughs> obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Mm. Now, you can take these texts out of context, then it becomes a pretext. Mm. Why? If you take out the context, they claim that if we teach women not to cut their hair, we must also teach them not to speak in the church, since the same word for shame mm. is used here. Mm. If Paul was teaching that, he would be contradicting himself. Mm -hmm. In the same epistle, which is already stated, that women did pray and prophesy in the church. Mm -hmm. So they overlooked the whole emphasis of it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now then, what Paul was talking about are the women prattling and shouting across mm -hmm. when they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. It's causing uproar in the church. Mm 